From the start of our discussion of monopoly, we've been describing firms that pick quantities and see what happens to the price as, as the quantity changes. And indirectly, we've been thinking about firms as actually picking the price uh, that they're actually going to sell. Uh, by picking the quantity and seeing what that implies for the price. Now this may have seemed very indirect and very roundabout in a way of actually setting prices. When you think about the decisions that firms actually make, the thing that they have control over is typically, well, what price do I put on this piece of merchandise? What uh, price do I say I charge my services for? Uh, they typically don't just say set the quantity and let the price actually uh, actually happen. Uh but this may have seemed a bit awkward to say that firms pick the quantity when we know from sort of real world experience that more firms than not tend to pick the price. Well, the first thing that will happen is that if you're a monopoly, well, you're facing a demand curve, and it turns out that it's just perfectly equivalent that if you're a monopoly, you're going to pick the price that maximizes profit. Well, that price that maximizes profit is the one that's implied by the quantity that maximizes profit. That is where you set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And so consumers will say, well, whichever one has the lower price, that's going to be the one that I'm actually going to pick. Let's consider the simple case of constant marginal costs. Let's suppose that Firm 1 sets a price of P1. In this case, Firm 1 is going to be making positive profits, and they'll sell out to that quantity. But if Firm 2 comes along and says, well, I know you're selling at a price of P1, I'm going to undercut you by just a little bit. All consumers in this market will go to Firm 2, and Firm 1 will go out of business. Uh, they, they won't make any sales. And what you would expect is when you have price competition in, in this matter, uh, what will happen is that the price will get driven down to the marginal cost. So you have more than one firm. They're both selling identical products. The only thing that differs is the price. And what happens is the price gets bid down to marginal cost. This is a special case. This is a really nice case to give us an idea of how fierce price competition can be. But let's consider a more complicated case, a case where the products aren't identical. Okay, so here's an example where we have demand curves for competing products, but these products are not identical. So if Firm 2 raises the price, there's going to be a greater demand for Firm 1's product, and vice versa. Uh, and the law of demand, holding constant in other prices, uh, also holds in this case. So this is about the simplest case that we could consider. So we have these two demand curves for Firm 1 and for Firm 2, and we ask ourselves, well, what if they pick the, the price instead of picking the quantity? Well, firms in price competition, just like firms in Cournot competition, maximize profit. So here's Firm 1's profit. This is uh, it's the markup of the price minus the marginal cost times the, uh, the quantity. Here we're assuming that there are no fixed costs. And let's assume that both firms face constant marginal costs of $1 per unit. The next thing we can do is go ahead and plug in for this quantity. Okay, so this is profit as a function of the two prices. Now this is Firm 1, so Firm 1 can only pick a price, the price P1, the price that he sets. And so let's take the first order condition for Firm 1. That's first times the derivative of the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first. We, we set that equal to zero, and this is going to be essentially the reaction function for Firm 1, given Firm 2's price. We Given that they're facing the same marginal costs and their demand curves are symmetric, they're going to end up setting the same price. Is that we can just plug in P for every instance of P1 or P2. I just used the distributive rule and then plugged in P for every instance of P1 or P2. Now let's go ahead and group terms. And now we can solve for P. And so we get a price of $4 per unit. Uh, and what we'll
we'll see is that this is the price for P1 and P2, and we can plug in and find out what quantities that each of these firms sell, plugging in, and we see that the quantity is six units. And so what we have is that this firm sells, uh, sells six units at a price of $4 per unit, and so we can compute profits. Remember, the profits are just the price minus the marginal cost times the quantity because we have no fixed costs. If there were fixed costs, we would just subtract off the fixed costs at this stage. On each unit, the firm is making four minus one dollars uh, per unit, and the firm sells six units. And so in this case, where we have differentiated products, that is that these, these uh, products, they are substitutes, but they're not perfect substitutes, they're not the same product. Uh, consumers actually value some attribute of, of each product for, uh, for whatever reason it is. Uh, what we see is the Bertrand competition, although it is vicious, it doesn't drive profits to zero. Each of these firms makes a profit of $18 in this case. And so what you can see is that this follows the very same logic that we had in Cournot competition. The only difference is that the way that we get our reaction function so we just take the derivative with respect to price. Instead of plugging in for an inverse demand curve, we plug in for a demand curve. And so what we get is we get, uh, we get Bertrand competition with heterogeneous goods. It sounds rather complicated, but it turns out to have a lot of the same intuition. Uh, merger analysis, when uh, the Department of Justice uh, decides whether to bring uh, bring a suit against a, a company to, uh, to block a merger, uh, they perform this type of analysis. They ask, uh, what's going to happen to the prices if we consider firms that are setting prices for goods that are not perfect uh, substitutes for one another? And this is the type of analysis that you would see done at, at sort of a, a Department of Justice. They may do use some um, real-world data to pin down what precisely these demand curves look like, but essentially this is the sort of baseline analysis that they're going to bring to bear in the real world. Um, so now you have a sense for how economists think about imperfect competition, how they think about monopoly, and how they think about how market power uh, affects firms' ability to raise price above marginal costs.